football uh, running through guests all night talking uh, spring practice. We've got Ben Belden on the line from under the dome. Uh, you can join him right there for Notre Dame football coverage. Ben, how you doing tonight? Not too bad, Mark. How are you? I'm doing just fine. You got your sweatshirt on. You ready to go? Yeah, yeah. Dressed for the occasion, I guess. <laughs> It looks good. Very nice. So you, you've uh, matched the green, the traditional Notre Dame green with the blue on the sweatshirt. It's all yeah. working. Yes. I'm doing some um, YouTube content at uh, at Under the Dome a little bit, and uh, I have purchased this green screen, which I obviously am not utilizing currently, but um, it was an, actually an inexpensive purchase, but cool stuff to do with it. So, Well, Ben, as soon as you utilize the green screen, you will be... Uh, miles beyond what we're doing here, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll try to catch up at some point. Uh, appreciate you stopping by to talk Notre Dame football, of course, coming off a college football playoff appearance and only one loss to eventual national champion Clemson. So I'm forgetting, Ben, whether we were able to discuss the playoff game, whether we talked, I know that we talked before the playoff game, whether we talked after the uh, Cotton Bowl game. Fortunately, I think I dodged that one. So, uh, but but we can talk about it now. Yeah. So for me, there was what five to six minutes left in the first half, and it was a three to three game. Even right. when it got to ten to three, it looked like, and I can't remember the exact sequences of series now, but I did at the time, in which it looked like Notre Dame would either be able to score. They got across the fifty a couple times, or would be able to at least, hey, let's run this clock out. Let's get back to the locker room at 10 to three. This is still a game. We're in good shape. And man, that uh, between Justin Ross and Trevor Lawrence in particular, and that Clemson defense, uh, but, you know, putting plays behind the line of scrimmage, it just unraveled quickly. Yeah. I, uh, I don't know. Brian Kelly this spring has been saying, it, there's a quote that people love to make fun of because people love to make fun of Brian Kelly that he said he likes about 80% of what went on in the Clemson game and 20% just didn't go Notre Dame's way, but that 20% was magnified because, you know, it was a big play for Clemson or, or something like that. And uh, I get what he's saying, and I uh, sort of agree. Um, I don't know. I think that, uh, like you said, I mean, it was definitely 9-3 to three late into the half. Um, Clemson was driving, and um, um, Ade Ogundeji, I had to think of his name for a second, came up with a big sack on third and – something when Clemson was getting into uh was getting into field goal territory and then Clemson missed the field goal and at that point I was kind of like all right well you know that was might have been the momentum shift Notre Dame needed but then they didn't do anything with it offensively um pretty much the rest of the game to be honest with you so you know it was a close game for a quarter and you know a half obviously you know a couple of uh coverage blunders there at the end of the first half you know made a pretty tight nine to three game go towards uh 23 to three at halftime pretty quickly. And then after that, it just, it sort of seemed like the, uh, the way Notre Dame was demoralized after that turn of events. Um, it was hard to recover from that against, you know, a, I mean, you go down 23 to three against a team like Clemson with their defense and you're just not going to do very well in general. And Notre Dame was never really able to catch their stride offensively. And it turned into, uh, what looked like a pretty solid, uh, butt whooping. So, um, but I do think that there are equal parts. You know, Notre Dame was closer than it looked, but it also was as bad as it looked, too, if that kind of makes sense. It makes sense to me because even before Brian Kelly made that ridiculous comment, and it's somewhat ridiculous, but you understand it and I understand it because within a context of watching a football game and trying to determine who the better team is, it was a ridiculous comment. But taken verbatim, he's probably not that far off. Um, I won't go to the extent of 80%, but I was sitting there thinking at half, what was it? It was it like 27 to three at halftime, something in that range. Yeah, it was to three. Yeah. Uh, I'm sitting there thinking if you charted every play, I bet Notre Dame has won more plays than Clemson. They were consistently making stops on defense over and over for that first quarter and a half. And they were making marginal gains on offense. Nothing that, broke Clemson's back or put points on the board, but they were getting first down, first down and making some positive plays on offense. And then, yeah, Clemson just hit them with the haymaker. So Notre Dame's wins on certain plays were 
a four yard gain, a five yard gain on defense, you know, holding Clemson to a three yard gain. Those were wins, but they weren't sure. game changing plays. Clemson made the five or six game changing plays in the first half that completely just showed their explosiveness and their talent and uh, made all the difference in the world. So yes, if you're going to take it to semantics and to the critical degree, yes, Brian Kelly was probably still exaggerating, but I get his point as you do. But uh, in terms of explosive plays, Clemson had it all over Notre Dame. Yeah. So, you know, and- ben, transitioning 2018 to 19, unless you get another point there, you can certainly jump in. Well, I mean, I guess just to sort of add to what you're saying, I mean, not that I'm making huge excuses and not that this is why Notre Dame lost, but I mean, it, even like the plays that were reviewed, like even just the ball seemed to be bouncing the opposite direction for Notre Dame, if that makes sense. I mean, everything that was reviewed, everything that every 50 50 call went against Notre Dame, not that it was the wrong call, but like just generally, you know, there, I think there were four reviews in the first half. All of them were took a positive Notre Dame play and made it into a negative Notre Dame play. And it's just, you don't see that very often. It's not that it was the wrong call or anything like that. I don't really think that's the case, but it was just, uh, it sort of seemed just kind of like an unlucky night for Notre Dame fans. So anyway, Talking Notre Dame football with Ben Belden from uh, Under the Dome. Please join him and the rest of the staff right there in covering Notre Dame athletics. Of course, uh, the NCAA tournament. I have no idea what Notre Dame's done this season on the hard court. It's not really much to talk about. They're uh, 13 and 16, I believe. All right, 13 and 16. Even if they were 29 and 0, we wouldn't be discussing it here. But it being the time of year, and I enjoy March Madness along with everyone else, I at least throw it out to the guests. So back to football. When you assess the personnel losses, the recruiting gains, which of course can't be factored in much because the freshman contributions are fairly minimal for most teams, more than they used to be, but still fairly minimal and going to pay off hopefully uh, down the road. Um, How do you assess the transition from 2018 to 19 and where are the concerns? Um, I think in general, the program is doing well. I think that and I'm going to write and talk about this in the coming days, but the NFL combine obviously was just this past weekend and just week and weekend, I suppose. And uh, I think the performance of Notre Dame players kind of shows you like where, where the program's going and where they're able to develop their players to get to. So, you know, if there's a time I think in Notre Dame's program in the modern era that they're going to start performing really well on a more consistent basis, I think that time is now. I'm talking more specifically about next year's team. I think, you know, there are some concerns. Um, Last year, they played two linebackers, Tavon Coney and Drew Tranquil, who never left the field. Who are the guys that replace them now that uh, they are gone to the NFL? That's a big question mark. Um, They also lost, you know, a first or second round pick, most likely in Julian Love at cornerback. And, when he was unable to play against Clemson in the Cotton Bowl, they really struggled. So who's going to replace him long term? They've got to find those answers. But, you know, defensive line, you know, Jerry Tillery, you know, another NFL guy that will be playing on Sunday's first, second round pick, most likely. How do they replace him? So, you know, I think there are holes that need um, that need filled, especially defensively. I think it's reasonable to say that um, – you can be more confident about who's filling those holes because the way Notre Dame has been able to develop players, land recruits and that type of thing as well. They've got a recruit in now um, Jacob Lacey, a defensive tackle, who's going to be probably, um, you know, on the two deep. So at defensive tackle, which means, you know, he's going to be getting, you know, 20, 30 snaps a game more than likely um, behind the guys that have put in a little bit more time in the program that are going to replace Jerry Tillery. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, Notre Dame is going to be able in some ways take a step forward next year. Um, But I've, you know, I've even said on my own show that taking a step forward does not necessarily mean even getting back. I don't think to the college football playoff necessarily. I think they can take a step forward and, and actually go nine and three, 10 and two type of a situation because they just got, you know, as Notre Dame sometimes, you know, often tends to have just a gauntlet of a schedule, you know, playing at Georgia, at Michigan and um, against USC and at Stanford and stuff next year as well. So I don't know that they'll be back in the playoff. A a lot of things would have to go right, but I think that the product is going to be good. And, you know, I think what 
hopefully is going to happen is that, is that people are going to see a more consistent Notre Dame program over the next uh, few seasons. All right, uh, Ben Belden getting us set on Notre Dame spring practice as uh, we get set for another Notre Dame season uh, as they finally made it to the college football playoff. I know that the um, the, the the format's only been in place since uh, 2014, but obviously people have been awaiting uh, Notre Dame making a run to a national championship game since 2012, haven't won one since 1988. And uh, despite the shortcomings against Clemson, we saw that uh, Clemson turned out to be pretty darn good uh, based on what they were able to accomplish against uh, mighty Alabama uh, just a week later. Uh, ben, you can join him and the rest of the crew there at uh, Under the Dome. Uh, ben, we appreciate you stopping by, talking Notre Dame football. Hopefully, um, once we get some news out of camp, we can have you back. Also look at the schedule and some other uh, positional breakdowns. Sure. Good luck with the rest of your show. Appreciate that, Ben. Thanks so Thank much. You. Ben Belden from uh, Under the Dome, talking Notre Dame football. And, uh, of course, this is Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, and we have delivered for you, I don't know, 10 or 15 conversations with uh, some of the best bloggers, broadcasters, and writers in the industry. Of course, I've got my analysis recently that has included ranking all 130 teams in the FBS from 130 all the way up to number one. We will do the same once I'm able to take in spring practice and the spring games and reassess uh, the talent losses and the personnel gains through recruiting. I'll re-rank the teams from 130 all the way up to number one for 2019. All right. I am ranking the coaches. I've gone through, let's see, every conference but the SEC, and I'm still making my way through the Big Ten. I will rank the coaches in every conference. Those videos are coming out very soon as well as uh, player rankings once we get through spring football and assess the freshman talent and that how that should factor into uh, our 2019 rankings. Uh, please join us uh, right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, and over on our Patreon page uh, where you can join us for more discussion on college football there at Mark Rogers TV. It's very simple, Mark Rogers TV on Patreon. I'm going to give a quick look to the live chat, and then I'm going to tap out for the night. 